Now, all right, good morning, and welcome to New Hope Baptist Church. It's a very interesting day. We couldn't keep the visitors away, so we have just a few visitors this morning, so we welcome them. Give them a hand. Yeah. Today is a very special day. I think you got me with a little bit of uh, feed, uh, not feedback, reverb. but uh, reverb there, Brad. Turn my reverb down just a little bit. Today is a very interesting day. Today is the one year spiritual birthday of Jennifer De Janeiro. Oh, Trusted okay. Christ one year ago today. Happy birthday, Jennifer. And it's my son's 28th birthday. He made it so far. Still here. That's good. And a lot of good things are going on. We've got a lot to look forward to today. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love and your kindness. We thank you for family. We thank you for the things that you are doing in our church family and the things that you're doing in all of our families. And we thank you that you are our Father, yes. the perfect Father. And we're joyful and grateful for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Come on in. Well, hello. Are this these your visitors? Oh, hi. Uh, Glad to have you. He did tell you we're low because we weren't having regular service. Oh, he didn't tell you? Oh. <laughs> the COVID. Yeah, yeah it's COVID sun service Sunday. It's COVID Sunday. <laughs> We're going to sing Blessed Be the Name of the yeah. Lord, um, written many moons ago. Let's all stand. This is, um, I'm sorry, we're singing How From a Foundation first. The old hymn you all know, so let's all stand and sing that. And we're missing band members. Anyway, one of them has COVID. <laughs> How firm a foundation he saved. Something's different. It's okay. Okay, so we're going to look at 1 Peter 5, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 this morning. And I had it there and it went someplace. There it is. <clears throat> Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, overseeing not under compulsion, but willingly according to God, <clears throat> not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to you, but being examples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So my name is Chris Marsh, since we have so many visitors. I'm the pastor here, and I've been here almost three years. It'll be three years in September. And that little passage of scripture is really written to pastors and elders, but it's also written to fathers, because every father should be pastor of his family Amen. and shepherd of his flock. And that is an amazing uh, passage that any father should look to as an example of how to lead in a godly way. And so usually I preach verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph through the Bible. We're about, we're in John 15 right now, finishing it up, fixing to go to John 16. But we've had seven cases of COVID. And so we've got about between a bunch of people in quarantine that are kind of rolling off right now. So it's been a little bit different time. So thankfully we have Facebook and YouTube. So we continue to do what we do. We've even been having Zoom Bible studies, which is new, but it's worked out pretty well. So we're taking a break from John because of just the unusual week, and we're going to talk about treasure hunt, the treasure of the family. And today we're going to talk about family. It's very interesting that we are. Uh, I shared when, um, as some of you were walking in, young lady that we got to lead to the Lord exactly one year ago. Today's her spiritual birthday, and today is my son's 28th birthday, my younger son. And we're going to talk more about it, but <clears throat> there's so much richness in the scripture. So I don't usually teach, uh, preach topically. I usually teach what's called expositional, which you just take paragraph by paragraph and just draw everything from the scripture. But today's a little different. So the one day you come, I do it totally differently. So if you hate it, come back next week. Okay. All right. Joanne, you ready? All right. We need our key hook. There we go. Why don't y'all stand for this song? Yes. We'll do that. Okay, this song is called Blessed Be the Name of the Lord by Vineyard. And um, plus one. And I've been feeling a little bit retro-y. So this is like, uh, I would say, early 90s. Yeah. Picture person open that. Okay. So what we're going to do is I sing. And on this part, people echo. If you can do it, it's okay if you can't. And Lynette's gonna echo. And then we all sing together. You'll kind of get it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord.
bright, the spirit and the bright say come. The spirit and the bright, the spirit and the bright, the spirit and the bright say come, Lord Jesus. The spirit and the bright, the spirit and the bright, the spirit and the bright say come. probably no more loaded term in our language today than the one word family. If I say family, immediately there's an emotional response. You either have a sense of satisfaction, your mind goes to a place of comfort, a place of tranquility, not often though, right? But you think of maybe Thanksgivings or warm fires or the people that you like to be with, if you have that encounter, as often there's been loss or pain or disappointment. And so the word family is a very loaded word. In every one of us, I think for most of us, family is, a, you're going to have to come over here, I guess, because I mean, otherwise, you might as well just come over here. So if you want to know why I'm looking over here, this is where everybody's at. Okay. Otherwise, I'm just going to be like that guy watching the tennis match, going back and forth and back and forth. That's just not show? right. Can I sit here? Wherever you want, or sit by your business. I didn't want to get the camera. Oh, you're fine. Okay, now, you'll know when I'm looking this way the whole time. That's where everybody's at. <laughs> Family's a loaded term. And for most of us, it's a mixed bag. Family changed for me radically uh, when I left the house and got married and shortly thereafter entered into police work, most of the people that I had Thanksgiving with and Christmas with for the first 21 years of my life were deceased within the next three years, most of them. And so I went through a crazy little whiplash time where everyone that had been family, family changed, changed completely. And then um, for Joanne and I, when we got married in 1989, we're coming up on 32 years, we'd always planned on having 10 kids. We're just going to have lots of kids. And we had miscarriage and miscarriage and tubal pregnancy and a baby that lived seven days and passed in our hands. And in the middle of that, we adopted two boys. And that was quite a, quite a ride when you adopt someone else's DNA. But our boys are 28 and 29. Joanne? Yes. Yes. Anyway, one of them gave us grandkids, and maybe the other one will be getting married soon. But for everyone, family, family is the next bag. And I'm going to give you something to look forward to. This may be one of the most important things you've ever heard in your life. If family for you is a source of either disappointment, pain, anxiety, because I'm going to give you something today from the scriptures that's going to give us a, a full view of what family actually is. And whatever your family experience has been, you think, well, that can't change. Yes, it can. And I'm going to show you how it can. Because I want to help you with a, a definition and an understanding from God's view that within three weeks, and I'm not kidding, within a month, if you want to have a completely different idea about family and family dynamic, you can. I'm not talking about psychology. I'm not talking about psychiatry. I'm talking about a God's eye view of what family is and who they are and how we can have healing and we can have what he intended for us to have while we're here. We have to have his perspective. We have to have his mind on it. We can't allow culture to tell us what it is. 
We can't allow even our own biological family to completely define it. It's bigger than that. So we're going to look at this from uh, several scriptures, but we're going to see now in the genesis of it, God's will for our offspring, the impact of Jesus on the family, the family of God, a settled family, separation of family, but the ultimate family reunion. We're going to look at the full, full picture here. And by the time we get to the end, you're going to understand that it's God's will that a family be something that you can cherish and something that you can encounter. And whatever yesterday held, it's available now in a way that you might not have thought of before. And so we have some more family. Let's get our pictures up. The Pagets had twins this week. And you remember when Izzy said, pray for me, I want a baby. She had, she had twins. That's what happens with the in vitro, all right? Thankfully, twins and not triplets. See, it's so easy, even a caveman can do it. So I could give him a hard time with his long hair. Oh, they didn't? Okay, Joanne can correct me. All right, anyway, they had twins. However they did it, they had twins. Y'all probably have some idea how that worked, but twins. So Jackson and Asher, and Asher's bigger, but he had more lung issues. So they're going to be in NICU for at least a couple of weeks. And Izzy and Jason actually came home briefly today, last night, to get things and regroup and go back to Medical City, Dallas, which is where they've been for, I think, 23 days. So... God answered Izzy's prayers. Jason wanted her to go strictly natural. And uh, the doctors intervened and said, that's not going to work. So she had the scheduled C-section around the doctor's golf game, of course. Not kidding. how that works. No, but it, when it was time, it was time. So our church is growing biologically. And we've been blessed this year. We've had, new, we've had people come to the Lord in the last two years. We've had young families join so we're a very balanced church right now, and we're thankful for that. And we finally have biological growth. Isn't that great? Give the Lord a hand. Yeah, yeah. That's exciting. So these are going to be beautiful little people. And uh, go back to the picture of Jason. Excuse me? Oh, okay, okay. Joanne says they are beautiful. We keep getting corrected. This was Joseph in the Christmas play last year. So if any of y'all are wanting to have kids and haven't had them yet, just be Mary and Joseph this year, and we'll see if we can help you, okay? <laughs> see if we can hook you up with that. All right, well, let's talk about family. And, wow, I mean, y'all remember James Dobson? Anybody remember him? Raise your hand if you remember James Dobson. I mean, for 35 years, I mean, yeah, I mean, since 1978, he was the man, right? And then suddenly he just kind of disappeared. Like, someone else kind of took over his ministry, and he got canceled because he was doing some amazing work in a place that wasn't popular, and Wow. You know, for, for three decades, he, he ruled as far as family information and Christians following his leadership. And, you know, he, he talked about biblical discipline and raising your child according to their bent and all the scriptural and biblical things. And he was the guy. And, um, you know, in the last few years, the family has just come under assault and culture has tried to redefine the family. But culture doesn't get to do that, right? I mean, the one that created it gets to say what it is, right? Okay. And so we can, we can wonder how that happened. I can tell you part of how it happened. Part of how it happened was for legal reasons. And then the second, and legal reasons, cultural reasons, and legal reasons, okay? So for legal reasons, when the whole abortion thing was going on, and, you know, when it was new, and, and it was all being debated and everything, and in criminal cases, they had to decide the Texas Penal Code began to define a person they didn't recognize personhood until you were born for the purpose of law enforcement, for the purpose of prosecution, for the purpose of judicial litigation. You're not a person until you're born. The only problem with that is it violates scripture and it violates science. But because that happened and that became uh, the case in the court system, that begins to impact the way people think, the way they think. Another thing that has changed the definition of family, besides the obvious downgrade of culture and a departure from the Bible and from Christ, was just the domestic partnership issue. Two people live together, they share everything. And so, you know, as far as the courts and who owns stuff, some of those ideas make sense as far as people just sharing stuff, but completely violate Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and everything the Bible tells us about who we are and who we're intended to be. So we're not going to make that case today. I've done that before and we can do it again. Anybody needs to talk about that, we can. But let's just talk about the genesis of the family. 
And that's God's general plan. God's general plan begins in Genesis 1, 26 through 31. You know it very well. And this is very interesting. And we're seeing it right now. We're seeing it with the Olympics. We'll talk about it. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. This is the counsel of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over every crawling thing on the earth. Guess what? The animals don't share the same rights as humans. The humans were giving authority over the animals. I mean, I'm concerned about the duck. I like ducks. I think they're really cool looking, but I'm not going to protest for the ducks. And one of the last arrests I made was a protester that was protesting for the ducks that were being overfed and they had fatty livers and the poor ducks were being abused and they were yelling at people going to eat duck at a French restaurant. I, the duck was for me. I wasn't for the duck, you know, so that was an interesting encounter. But you have the people, the eco uh, people and the animal people, and we love animals. You know, Joanne loves everything that breathes. I'm only permitted to shoot hogs and what else? Snakes. Those are the only... Only two things I'm permitted to shoot. And armadillos are getting higher on my list. They're tearing my place up really. Joanne still likes the armadillo. So the last time she told me not to shoot an armadillo, it was one that I found out that I'd already shot. And he just came back to tell him and he laid down in my yard so she'd know I shot it. And those of you that don't know that are new to the country, armadillos will tear your place up as bad as a hog. You can, you can go back over the hog stuff. The armadillos go down and make a cone in your yard. And you'll step in it and break something and die. All right. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Watch. Male and female, he created them. I'll talk about gender for one minute, and I'm going to let it go because we're going to talk about family. But I've I got to do this. When I, was, when I was brand new in master's work, and master's work is different than bachelor's work. If anybody's ever gotten a master's degree, when you do your master's work, you have to read, write, and defend. Okay. When you're doing bachelor's work, you read and you regurgitate, okay? You just take tests, right? And you, you write little papers and stuff, that's fine. But when you're in master's work, you have to read, write, and then you stand up in front of your class, of your peers, and then you read it to them. And if it doesn't make sense to them, then you go through all that. So you, you have motivation to do a really good job and be very thorough. And I had a, a professor one time that wanted to say that it's inappropriate to refer to God I don't know. He was having issues with people over anthropomorphizing God because the Bible talks about God the Father as being pure spirit. And so when we talk about God being a male figure, maybe that's going too far. And I said, time out. There's more to maleness than plumbing. Okay? There's more to maleness than plumbing. And we'll see in a moment that when God took Eve from the man, it was for a very specific purpose because men, men need help. Any ladies agree with that? Amen. They need help. We're not good by ourselves. And so we don't have good ideas. We, we, need, we have ideas, but our ideas need help. And so I debated this guy for about 30 minutes, and at the end of it, he conceded. And I said, look, first of all, the Bible calls him he. And if the Bible called God, if he calls him a father and he calls him he, who are we to call him anything else? Number one. Now, if that's true, and God is he, and yet God the Father is pure spirit, guess what? There's more to gender than plumbing, folks. You can rearrange the plumbing. It doesn't mean you've rearranged the gender. And now in the Olympics, that's coming up. Because everyone's like, hey, live and let live. Let them do whatever they want to do. But it's not like, wait, wait a minute. Your son's wrestling my daughter, and I don't think that's fair. So it's funny how that comes, <laughs> comes back around and, you know, so, you know, it's supposed to all be okay, and then suddenly it's not when it affects you. So God created them in his own image, male and female. I want to say, and I'll just stop there on that scripture, but I do want to say one more thing. The great Adrian Rogers, the great Adrian Rogers. How many of y'all used to listen to Adrian Rogers? Hard to believe he's, he's passed away in 2005. One of the great voices for Jesus. He came to the Criswell College, one of the most incredible messages we had there. And he said to us, he said, a man is infinitely superior to a woman at being a man. And a woman is infinitely superior to a man at being a woman. Viva la difference. Mm -hmm. He said, if I had to have a, you know, some, a whiskery cheek to rub up against my whiskery cheek, I'm just not interested. And that was a pretty good, pretty good thing. All right. 
Well, that's the general plan. God's plan brought to life and set in motion. Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord said, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then God had a sense of humor. He kind of pranks at him and he makes all the animals, right? It's like, uh, huh, what? I don't think, anyway. So two through, uh, Genesis 2, 20 through 24. The man gave names to all of the livestock and all the birds of the sky and every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. And in the Hebrew, it's not actually a word that means rib. It's just took from his side. Took from him. From his substance, from his essence, from his side. And Crystal used to say, he didn't take from the head that she should rule over him. He didn't take from the foot that he should trot upon her. Took from the side that they should face life together, that they should multiply the joys together, divide the burden together, and face life together. And that's what Chris used to say. And the Lord God fashioned, the word there is bana, like, like building a, a, an, an architectural masterpiece. Bana is to build. It's to build intricately. It's to build well. We've all been in houses that were cheaply built, all right? And we've been in houses that were built by a craftsman. That everything there was quality, it was deep, it was thick, it was heavy, it was, it was something that was well made, well fashioned, beautifully fashioned. And the Lord God fashioned it into the woman from the side which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And he said, now this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman or whoa, man, because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. And she'll be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one in flesh. A little hint there in how to be married. You've got to leave the mom and the dad. Somebody said a thousand miles is about the right distance. <laughs> no. A lot, hey, there's a lot of marriages that struggle because nobody ever left mom or dad. That's, that's one of the top three issues in marriage. So the top four, that's, that's up there. That's up there. That's a big deal. So that was God's plan set in motion and God's will for structure and stability. We find in 1 Corinthians eleven three. I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of every woman and Christ is the, that God is the head of the Christ. And all of God's women want to say what? <laughs> well, Ephesians 5 puts it in perspective. Ephesians 5 says, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, but husband." Because the, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, and somehow the other scriptures didn't get in there. The rest of it is, husbands love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave his own body. Gave his own body. Here it is. Gave his own body. Here's the deal. If we as men are loving and serving and leading our wives with such sacrificial love that we're laying our lives down, it's not hard to roll with that, right? We're not talking about Kirk shouting orders from the bridge of the enterprise. We're talking about husbands leading in loving and in sharing God's word. The Bible talks about the husband washing his wife with the water of the word. And it compares the relationship to Jesus who washes the body of Christ with the water of the word to present to himself a bride spotless, spotless bride. How many ladies show up for their wedding after working in the yard? Don't do that, right? You wear a $8,000 dress. How much are they now? Well, we get ours for free or was it $100? We were poor. We were really poor. We were so poor. We got our, you're running away from a, okay, don't say it. $100? Okay, yeah. Pawn shot, Miss Dallas. But hey, we were poor, but we were happy. What? Oh, that one was, that one was new? Okay. Okay, maybe the other. Anyway, all right. I'll stop. So, remaining married, that's the next topic. No. Okay. Structure and stability. God has a structure. And his structure works. Not that the man is bossy, pushy, lording it over. And that's what we said in 1 Peter 5, right? Not lording it over the flock, but being an example, right? Not being harsh, not being dictatorial, but leading. 
leading in righteousness, leading by example, leading in the word. 0.02% of couples that read the Bible and pray together get divorced. 0.02. The national average for divorce is over 50%. When I was working for Dallas, the average was 87%. 87. 87%. And um, it's hard. And it's in certain jobs, it's harder. But God is good. Let's talk about godly offspring. And so when we, when we, when we do that, sometimes it, as men, it can't be overemphasized the need. And we're going to talk about godly offspring. And the little poem I'm going to read to you this is actually a song. This applies not only to raising kids, but also applies to, to our relationships with our brides. And it's in here, and I had it, and now I've got to find it. Okay, so can not How many of you remember the song, Cats in the Cradle? Man, I listened to James Dobson talk about that song for, I'm not kidding, 25 years. And I always thought, man, that won't be me. And now, it's me. Um, I've got it. Thank you. Thank you, anyway. I'm not kidding. I, t- I listened to Dawson talk about this for 25 years. I thought, that won't be me. And now it is. My child arrived just the other Brand new babies. Brand new babies. My child arrived just the other day. He came in the world in the usual way. But there are planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he'd say, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, the little boy blue and the, boy, and the man on the moon. When are you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I've got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. It said, I'm going, to be like, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be like him. Cats in the cradle, the silver spoon. Little boy blue, man on the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when. But we'll be together then. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came home from college the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm so proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head. And they said with a smile, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? Cats in the cradle, silver spoon, little boy blue, the man on the moon. When are you coming home, son? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you, if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. As I hung up the phone, it occurred to me. He'd grown up to be just like me. My boy is just like me. I remember the days when... We adopted our boys, and uh, so we needed more money. So I'm walking the projects for extra money, and I'm patting little kids on the head while my kids are at home. And I remember the day that I thought, that really doesn't make any sense. And I remember a time when I was in my 20s, late 20s, that I chose to just make some changes because I needed to be patting my kids on the head and not somebody else's kids on the head. We're all in a different place. I'm semi-retired. I'm retired from one job, doing another full-time job. Not completely retired, but we're all in a different place. But we're also all in a place where we have an opportunity to read the landscape. Where are you at? Are you doing what you need to do? Are you doing what, are we doing what we should do? 
Is there anything we can change? All I can do as a 53, fixed to be 50 year old father of 20 something kids is make opportunities for them to come. That's all I can do now. I got one that I, you know, bribe with shooting stuff. We have shooting fellowships all the time. And he's a gun nut now and he's actually against Smith. And he comes out and he loves to shoot with me. The other one I'm trying to figure out what to do with him because he's got the kids and he's working all the time and he's harder to get a hold of. <clears throat> whether you are young married, young family, where I am or whether you're far beyond that, each of us, each of us has an opportunity to measure our involvement, our activities, and our impact. Some of us need to do less. I don't know what you need to do. I don't know. I know for me, even for me, there's times I don't answer the phone. There's times that I already know that I've done so much. Joanne's like, Netflix time. You've done all them. It's time to sit down and, yes, ma'am. It's just time. Put the phone on, do not just, you know, if it's an absolute emergency, if they call me three times, I know someone's died. It just, that's the way it is. But <clears throat> all of us, regardless of where you are in the process, whether you're a young mother or a grandparent or somewhere in between, we all have the opportunity to reassess. Most of us used to do less, need to do less. I realized when I was recounting some of the story of my life to one of our visitors that when I was doing master's work and pastoring a church and working for DPD, I was probably doing too much. And at one point in our marriage, I told Joanne, I said, I promise I won't do three things anymore. I'll just do two. And that was a big deal. <clears throat> and uh, one of the times that I realized I was doing too much was when I was driving a road. And this is interesting how this happened. I was driving down the road and the road curved, but my car didn't. Now, you got to understand that Dallas cops never sleep on duty, but occasionally we pray. And I found myself in prayer on the road until I hit the pole, right? And so there are things that happen that are wake-up calls. And when we hit a pole, right, it's a clue, right? And we talked a few weeks ago about people that see the, the lights on the dash of the car. If you ever known anybody that, or maybe it was you, I mean, I'll confess I've done it at least once or twice. A light comes on the dash of your car and you pray a prayer like this, as ridiculous as it is, as it is, you pray this prayer. You say, God, please let that be a mistake. It's a mistake that you don't just take it to the mechanic, okay? <laughs> we see the light on the dash, we're like, God, let that be wrong, you know? No, you know, and, and, and this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us. And so, Godly offspring, how does it work? Uh, well, let me, let, me, let me do this one more thing. Um, in Matthew 19, when the lawyer was trying to trick Jesus and he said, hey, can you divorce, get divorced for just any old reason? You know what Jesus did? He went back to the plan. He quoted the plan. This is Matthew 19. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has put together, let no one separate. And then they wanted to argue about Moses and why did he give us the law? And he said, because you're going to do it. So he gave you a way to do it. Now, having said that, let me say, there's grace in everything. And having worked with people who experienced divorce at an 87% rate, I saw a lot of grace and I saw a lot of sadness. And I, I've seen a lot. You know, I've seen a lot. But let me tell you something. God is so good. He is so good. Wherever we've been, our mission is to move forward in the grace of God and in the joy of God. Amen. That's what our mission is. Amen. And, you know, because we have boys that came from other people's DNA, and we've seen this a lot because we've had a lot of other friends that adopted, we have to be careful about not creating this fantasy or idea that's not really realistic and then having some regret or having some, some thinking that we wish we had something that we didn't have. So many people, you know, oh, if I just knew my, my birth family, this, and then they meet them, and then they're really, it's not really an impact. Or there's some people that meet their family, and it's a big deal, right? It's like, wow, you know, we're just like each other, and we had so much in common. That happens. But here's what also happens. What also happens is sometimes 
people meet that birth family or, or people that they're related to that they didn't know with all this Ancestry.com, and they really wish they hadn't because really negative things happen as a result of that. Sometimes God is gracious by reorienting us, sometimes by, 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 by the changes that he does allow to be made. So changes do happen, and there's an allowance in the scripture even for divorce. But the main thing is that we understand that God wants us in the family that we currently have to be excellent in him. And when we apply godly principles in the family that he's given us, we're going to have joyful results. doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Marriage is probably one of the most picked on institutions that there is, right? We were joking, we were joking earlier on, I won't call any names, someone's about to get married and someone else that hasn't even ever been married was going, don't do it! And we're like, how do you know? You haven't even tried it. I mean, marriage is one of the most picked on institutions that there is. There are people that are married and happy. There are people that are married and miserable. There are people that are married and they're happy to be miserable. And, you know, what, was that, what was that song that Huey Lewis sang, Happy to be Stuck with You? All right. All right. Well, if we have offspring, we want them to be godly offspring. And this is kind of what we want to see happen. I'm going to have to go faster. Yes, I am. All right. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And that literally means, that, that literally is according to his God-given bent. So you, take, you don't go against the grain. You try to work with how that kid is naturally made. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, that's not a, that's not a money-back guarantee, okay? That is a general principle. That is a proverb, which is a general truth. It's generally true. You can't come back to God like Amazon and go, I'm not, give me a refund. I won't, it's not working, you know. It's not like that. It's a general truth, okay? There have been exceptions. Proverbs 13, 24, he who holds back the rod hates his son, he who loves him disciplines him gently. Diligently, thank you. Diligently, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, uh, listen, our kids need discipline. Texas is an amazing place. We've got one, we've got one guest here from another country. He's from California. But, <laughs> but we welcome him here. And uh, as long as he doesn't bring any California politics, but that's why he's here, because he, he's here for that reason. Listen. Chapter 9 of the Penal Code in Texas says you have the right to use physical force if need be to maintain order in your household. That's a, that's a very biblical concept. We're not talking about abusing kids. We're not talking about harming kids. We're talking about controlling kids. And let me tell you that if you don't control your kids, somebody else, somewhere else will. It's not if they're going to be controlled. It's only by whom. And it's going to be much gentler and much better for them if they're controlled by someone that loves them enough to care for them and do it properly than the person that doesn't care. There's a lot of people out there that don't care. There's a lot of institutional abuse. Let's make the institution of the home the place where, where management happens in a biblical sense and in a rightful and a lawful sense so that we're able to uh, help to shape these little creatures. Before our kids were our kids, they were our foster kids. And um, they knew that we were not supposed to biblically discipline them, so we didn't. And they'd stand in the corner and yell at us at the top of their lungs. And I would smile, and I would give them a date. <laughs> On that date, your name is Marsh, and things will change. And they did. They did. And if you speak to either one of my boys today, it's yes, sir, and no, sir. But here's the balance. Here's the balance. We're not to be harsh. And I always wanted to read this verse to my dad, but I never had the courage to do it. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. That's the gentleness part. What Dobson did very well is Dobson used to always talk about rearing kids was a balance between discipline and love. Discipline and love. And as long as you keep these things in balance, there's never a question about if you're a monster or not. If you're loving and thoughtful and creative and, and um, you know your child and you're loving your child according to knowledge, they're not going to think you're a beast when you have to teach them discipline. And someday when they're making a good salary or they're in authority over other people and their life is just in order, they'll thank you for that. They'll thank you for that orderly raising. 
What we want is this result. Luke 2.52. And Jesus was advancing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. What's, what's this about? Remember when Jesus went to the temple? He's 12, whatever. He goes to the temple, they lose him. <clears throat> they get him back. And they talk about that little time period where he was right there at that little, fixing to be a teenager, growing in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God. That's what we want, right? That's what we want. We want that for our kids. That's the desired result. And so this is a bleed over. My secretary asked me, did you make a mistake? No, it was on purpose. Because when we come to the next step and we said, what's the impact of Jesus on our family? Jesus. Well, it should be this, that our kids and the people that we're doing family stuff with, that they're advancing in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God, that's what we want, right? That should be the impact of Jesus. Dr. Chris, I'll share with you before, has said, we take for granted how Jesus has civilized us. Jesus has made us more civilized. If you don't believe it, choose any nation or group in history that has divorced themselves from Christ and watch the downgrade. Look at the country that you live in. Study before 1960. Study what our nation was like before 1960. Look at Supreme Court decisions. Look at cultural movements and watch where we are now, where any evil thing can happen. If you can imagine it, it's happening. That's where we are. When the flood came, every man's thought was evil continually. We're not that far exactly, but in some corners, we are. We are. And so that is the mission that we grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Here's the sad possibility. The sad possibility is Matthew 10. And this is where we start defining family for us. This is where it's a turn, it's a sadness, but it's also a blessing. It's okay. It's going to be all right. The good news is coming on this. Some of you have been bewildered. Some of you thought you knew what family was. You were rolling along with your family. Things like, I know who my family members are. I know who my people are. And then, what was that? Something happens. There's a division. There's pain. There's separation. There's a conflict. What's going on? It could be for selfish reasons. It could be for wrong reasons. And sometimes it's not for wrong reasons. Look, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Try following Jesus closely and see how your relationships change. If you're following Jesus closely, your relationships have changed because not everybody can hang with that. They don't understand you. They want to call you things that aren't nice. They, 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 they don't know. They don't understand your motives. When your motive is just to follow the Lord Christ and to be conformed to his image, not to be conformed to the ways of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But last week we heard Jesus say, they will hate me because they, they will hate you because they hated me. The slave's not greater than the master. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they listen to my word, they'll listen to your word. The truth is, is that the world hates those that won't join up. And we're not joiners of the world. We're to be separated from the world. That's what holiness means. Holiness is to be set apart, cut apart, different, set aside. And the world doesn't get it. The world takes it as rejection when actually we're the world's only hope. That's the irony. The irony is they're missing the, they're missing the boat. They're missing the hope. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his whole own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know what this tells me? There is family conflict that happens as a result of the righteousness of Christians. It does. And when we look at what Jesus said last week, if they hated me, they'll hate you. That we experience rejection and hatred often when we are completely committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. People just don't understand it. The Bible talks about the wisdom of God being foolishness to men. Foolishness. And so they don't get it. And so there's this, this thing that can happen. It's, 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 
It can happen. But Galatians 6 1 says, Brothers, even as one is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one to yourself. In the spirit of gentleness, each one of you looking to yourself. Let me find myself here. Where did that come from? So, the, so now let's talk about the true family of God. Let's talk about the family of God. So we have biological family. You don't get to pick them, right? And if you have adopted kids, you pick them. They didn't necessarily pick you. You pick them. But let's look at the family of God. Then we're going to look at the settled family. And then we're going we're gonna to kind of conclude a little bit. So those are those that are of the household of faith. We're to restore those that are... Um, find themselves in a place that they shouldn't be. Look at the household of God in Ephesians 2.19. So that you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints. You are God's household. The Bible talks about the family of God. We are God's household. Next, Ephesians 3.12-19. through 19. I love this. This is really good. In whom we have boldness and confident access through him in faith. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart, at my afflictions on your behalf, which are to your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Father. Jesus says that when we talk to God, we should call him Father. Our Father who art in heaven. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would give you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit to the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being firmly rooted, grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height of depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Listen to this. Listen to this. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. You have a family. You're the family of of God. Some of your family is still here. Some of your family is there. What does this tell me? What is family from God's perspective? Jesus said, who is my family? Who is my family? The settled family. We settle on who our family is. We understand who our family is. Then we understand things better and we have less tension. There's a natural tension from family stress. And understanding this from God's perspective takes away that tension. It takes away the tension of the disappointments. It takes away the sting of the rejection because we begin to see things the way that God sees it. The crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. That's when they didn't get it yet. They didn't understand. In answering, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking out to those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. And whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Every one of us has a natural, God-given, biological family. But what God says is, your family is beyond the biological. Because each man and each lady chooses whether to love God or love self. There's going to be a natural division. It's going to be a natural sword. It's like a cake. It's like a, a knife cutting a cake. There's going to be a separation. Okay, there's going to be a separation because you can't love Jesus and put Jesus on the throne of your heart and love yourself and put yourself on the throne of your heart in a person that has themselves on the throne and a person that has Jesus on the throne. That makes a natural conflict. Okay? Or you can take yourself off and put somebody else on the throne that's not Jesus. Same conflict. To put anything on the throne of your heart other than Jesus is idolatry. So when you do that, you're creating conflict. And, the, and what Jesus says here is I, I want you to experience what Paul says. I want you to experience the fullness of God. Do you want to have a joyful family experience? Come back. I have a life group. They refuse not to meet, just like you refuse not to come to church today. Praise God. My life group refuses not to meet. So we've had two Zoom Wednesday night life group meetings because our people live together. They love each other. They take care of each other. They're family. And the truth is, is the people that you share Jesus with often are closer to you than your biological family. We are the family of God. 
Now, we would like our biological family to be included. Yes? Doesn't always happen. Wherever your biological family is, your family can be right here. Whatever your frustrations are, you can experience the love of God, what the Bible calls koinonia, of the ecclesia. You know what ecclesia is? Ecclesia is the word for church. You know what that means? The called out ones. Ek is out. Ek is out. Lysia is, is a gather. The called out, called out ones that meet together with Jesus in common. And this is why I tell you that whatever your frustrations are, whatever your pain has been, whatever your history has been, whatever your letdowns have been, you can enjoy the fullness of the family of God by showing up and getting to know each other and loving each other and supporting each other and encouraging each other and learning from each other and being sharpened by one another right here. I encourage someone to move beyond the idea of a a 12-step program, and they have their place, I guess, somewhere. Maybe some people have been helped. The problem is, even Rick Warren's 12-step program, Celebrate Recovery, what it does is you're celebrating yourself. I've done it. I've, I've been good for this long. Stop. Celebrate Jesus. Amen. Celebrate Jesus. Because the problem with Celebrate Recovery or, is you're looking, you're, you're, give me my pen, give me my, I did, stop. Get beyond me. Your only hope to move beyond yourself is to get Jesus focused. And when you're Jesus focused, I told somebody yesterday, everything that you can get in a meeting like that, you can get right here. We're going through this book right now, R.C. Sproul, uh, Essentials of the Christian Faith. And it's amazing. And we go through two little chapters, like two, two page chapters, and the scriptures that go with it. We're going through this uh, every week. We're about not quite, well, halfway through. This is amazing. It's awesome. We talk about everything that the Bible teaches about Jesus and everything that the Bible teaches, we do it every week. And Anything that any of that other stuff can offer, we meet regularly, we pray together, we talk together, we share our burdens, we help each other, we know each other. If some person does something, we, we all know what each other's done. You have the accountability, you have the encouragement, all that is there. That's why God made the church. That's why it says in Hebrews, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together, as is the habit of some. Not because we're trying to be religious, not because we're trying to check boxes and be a better Christian than somebody else. Because we need it. We need it. All right, well, we need to, do we need to? Yeah, I guess we kind of need to wrap it up. Y'all not if we stay here till one, right? Okay, all right. Family of God. Oh, man. John 13, 35, by this we will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I can brag on this church. People here love each other. They don't just do it in word. They do it in deed. Yes, Don? They do it in deed, right? We've had someone that has uh, been very kind to give to the benevolence ministry of our church and we've taken care of two, three, four families with COVID and other needs and we actively, continually take care of each other, whatever that means. Whether it's taking food to each other or taking care of medical bills when someone's in transit, we, we, we just do that. We do that here. And anybody that has been around us knows that. We're a loving family. We take care of each other. And I'm proud of our church for that and the generosity of others. Well, lastly, two things. Separation of family and the ultimate family reunion. I remember one time when I was pastoring a church and there was a widow in the church and her husband had been the former pastor. That's never easy, but uh, that's a ministry point. But anyway, she was talking to me one day, actually talking to me and Joanne, and she's sitting across the table from us and she goes, one of you, one of you is going to die first. Okay, duly noted. Thank you for the encouragement. The fact is that we have an expiration day. We have a day that we're going to meet Jesus. And that's a reality. When that happens, there are two responses. There's the response of the task-oriented person, and there's the response of the very loving person. You know what it is? The exact same response. When Lazarus died, both Mary and Martha approached Jesus and said, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Martha said it, and Mary said it. Two completely different temperaments. I don't care how much faith you have. I don't care what a great person you are. I don't care whatever. When death happens, it's natural to look to God and say, hey, that's the natural response. I thought somehow I was in the club. 
I thought this wasn't going to come to me. I thought this wasn't going to come to me in this way. Many of you have childish ideas about death like I did when I was a child. When I was a child, my great-grandmother died, and I go, okay. I went home and made a chart. You know, she was this age. She was the oldest. Okay, granddad's next, then grandma, then Uncle Herman. You know, I, I have my list of who was going to go when. Of course, it doesn't happen like that, right? I thought I had it all figured out. We don't ever have death figured out. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed to us and our sons that we may obey this law. The things that are his are his. There's a lot that's going to happen into your life. And you're going to look up and you're going to go, God, I thought I was in the club. I thought that uh, you and I were tight. And I thought that you helped me to understand. I thought I was kind of the VIP. And the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of things that we're not going to understand the side of heaven. And there's a lot of things that we may not understand when we're there because he's got and we're not. Even though there's separation and those times are hard and those times are sad, it's not God's will that we live in the past. Now, we, we honor the past, but we don't live in the past. We have to move forward, don't we? We're still responsible for what we have right now. We're still responsible for who we have, this body, this church, our family, the family of God. We're still responsible to be attentive, to be involved, to be helpful, to invest in one another. That's what we do. Sometimes that involves fun things. Yesterday, we had a trilateral uh, deal, the uh, arms deal, you know, gun deal between me and these two guys back here. We all got to kind of trade around guns and money. When we left, everybody was happy. Praise the Lord, we have shooting fellowships in this church. We have guns and God right here. Come on back. Once a month, we shoot steel, man. We have a good time. We have a really good time. In the name of Jesus. Well, we take care of each other. And we can't live in the past. And we, and we, we do suffer loss. And we do have sadness. But we can't live in the past. We've got to stay attentive. We've got to stay involved. We've got to take care of each other. But you know what we have to look forward to? The ultimate family reunion. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Go, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's the point. Together. You know what family is? One word, together. It's together. We're just together. Joanne and I, when we started our life group, it was people that pretty much we led to the Lord and it was newer people in the church and they needed to be discipled and they needed to learn things. And we've been walking together in such a way <coughs> that they refuse not to be together. They all got COVID together. They've been all living in the same house together. <laughs> the house and the guest house. They were up in the hunger in the bunker together. One of, them, uh, one of the families had an air conditioner go out. And they go, oh, well, we'll just go live with all our people. Well, and they did because they've had no air conditioner and it's been 100 degrees outside. But they're all getting over COVID together, praise the Lord. So family's together. It's together, it really is. You know where I'm going. And Thomas said, we don't know. We don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And here is the family reunion ultimately realized. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as those, as do the rest who have no hope. Oh, you're a new hope. Don't have no hope. Don't grieve as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain will until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Does anybody besides me look forward to that? Is that going to be amazing? Is that going to be amazing? With the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together, 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 with them in the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. What? How does it end? Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let me comfort you. Nobody here. You're all humans. Nobody here. Nobody there. Nobody out there. Nobody has a perfect family encounter. Anybody that comes together in the Lord Jesus Christ has something to look forward to. 
an equality, loving, thriving family that will divide the burdens and multiply the joys. God's will is our unity. We're going to get to John 17. I talk about it every week. Go home and read it. Jesus, I just, I want them to know me like I, I want them to know me for who I really am. I just can't wait for them to be with you and you to be with me and us to be together. John 17, the high priestly prayer of Christ is he's about to go to the cross and he's looking so forward to the realization of the mission, not just for our sins being forgiven, yes, but far beyond the forgiveness of our sins, our walk with him, the restoration of our relationship with him, where it was with Adam that they used to walk together in the morning, in the cool of the day, that relationship is restored, and then we as family come together and build literally the body of Christ, as each one of you do the things that God has made you to do, whether it's him playing guitar or her playing guitar. It used to be my guitar. I had a custom made, but then she put stickers and things on it, so I had to give it to her. Anyway, whatever you do that God made you to do for him that makes you a beautiful part of the body of Christ, whether lifting up your voice or lifting up your voice or going out and telling the truth and helping people that need help, whatever it is, this is what we have. It's available. So whatever your pains are, whatever your disappointments are, however imperfect your biological family is, don't write them off. But put your money in the account where it's not going to disappear. Don't put your money in the account of the bank that may be going out of business next week. Don't give it to Bernie Madoff. Put your money, put your life, put your energy, put your investment someplace where there's going to be progress. So we invite you to do that here. We invite you to do that here. If you don't know Jesus, you need Jesus. If you do know Jesus, you need a church. You need a place where you can walk with him. And... It's a, I mean, I, just, I can't even tell you enough. I just, the joy it is, and we could have people give testimony, but the joy it is for us just to walk together and to help each other and to love each other and to enjoy each other. We just enjoy each other. We're, whether it's shooting stuff or joining painting stuff or, you know, whatever it is, whatever we do. Cameron injured, you know, she's really good with this stuff. She makes it look like, you know, high tech, very expensive equipment they used to have. Jesus died for you. Jesus is God. He died to pay the price for your sins, but he died to unite you with God the Father. Stand with me. Do you know him as your Savior? Do you know that you know that if you were to die today that you'd be in heaven? 1 John 5.13 tells us it's his will that you know that you have eternal life. Some people don't think that you can know. The Bible says it's his will that you do know. If you don't know, get with me. Okay? If you have any other decision to make with the Lord, then we can pray together and you can just let me know. Uh, we didn't want to pass the plate today because of the code thing. We've got a giving box in the back. If you, uh, Those of you that are visitors, I'd love for you to fill out a card and put it back there so I can get with you later and we can meet you. That'd be awesome. We have one whole restaurant in this town. We're all going to go there. So it's up the street called The Point, the marina. We're going to go up there and eat stuff. And when you eat the fish, it didn't come out of the lake. But uh, it's, uh, it's they got pretty good food up there. So, All right.